Hi, I'm Leah Wheatholter, and this is the Investigation Game Podcast. Welcome to the Investigation Game Podcast. I'm Leah Wheatholter, CEO of Workman Forensics in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Joining me today is Nick Decker. In 2005, Nick began his career as a private investigator. It became evident soon after that there was a lack of overall quality of service and innovation in the Oklahoma market. So Nick sought out veterans in the fields of personal injury, nursing home abuse and neglect, and criminal defense investigations who exemplified these long lost qualities and studied the foundational principles and practices that built their stellar reputation among their clients and colleagues. One year later, in 2006, Paradigm Investigations was born out of Nick's drive for excellence to restore honor to this field. It is the same passion and drive that continues to accelerate each of Paradigm's investigations cases to success today. Nick has agreed to share stories about his investigations, so I just wanted to mention that this might be an intense or heavy topic for our listeners. Thank you so much for joining me today, Nick. Thank you for having me, Leah. I know we're here to talk about a pretty, what could be a really heavy topic today, but before we get into that, I have to start this episode like I do just about every other episode with a private investigator. How did you end up in this field? I was actually encouraged by, I have several colleagues in federal law enforcement, local law enforcement down in the Oklahoma City, Oklahoma area. Federal law enforcement was, uh, there's the custom National Custom Aviation Center down there for what used to be known as U.S. Customs. Now it's known as ICE, uh, Immigration Custom Enforcement. Uh, a lot of those guys that were there at the time, they encouraged me to get into the private sector of investigations as I was able to see a lot of detail, a lot of data analytics, uh, which is you well know that that's a big chunk of what we do is having the ability to see things that most other people don't see. And so they they kind of guided me in that direction as a as a good fit for them because they were kind of my mentors at that time. Yeah, awesome. So what is one of your favorite things about being a PI? You know, honestly, I, I say this to a lot of the people that I interview and a lot of people that I, I actually work with, the, even my clients, the attorneys and individuals. One of the, my favorite things as a PI is to be a third party. Where Whoever pays my check, it does not matter to me. I am an unbiased individual. I come in, I look at all the facts, and then I just present them. So it doesn't matter who writes the check, who is the one that issued the case, I'm the person that gets all the details. I can take the case and pursue it as how I see fit to make it the most complete and comprehensive court-ready report for the client. Yeah. So I think having worked with law enforcement and then also as a private investigator, I do like the private side of things a lot um, for a lot of reasons. But I do like just being able to go in and, and have that third party approach to an investigation. That's really great. Absolutely. Really great. So what was one of the most surprising things you discovered after entering this industry? Now, that's that's an easy one for me. And of course, other PIs may say something different, but you could have the best skills, the best training, and the best results. But if you don't have marketing in the PI industry, you're never going to get noticed, which means no cases. And, you know, and as I always liked uh, Gary Glanz's adage that we're only as good as our last case, that's true, but if you don't have marketing, no one's going to see you. And no one can, you can't perpetuate that, lack of a better word, a stigma about your your reputation. Yeah, so, you know, the phrase, if you build it, they'll come. I don't feel like that's true in our world. Oh, like, no. I mean, it's fine. You have to build it so that someone will come. But uh, most importantly, you have to tell people that that's what you built. Yes, yes. So you have to put and you have to continually market yourself. It can't just be like it's up here, but it just has to keep you have to keep generating and keep putting money in to make sure those cases and people know that you're still there and that your name is still out there in the PI industry because we're always in the background. It's not like one of those things where you see uh, a QT or a Blue Cross Blue Shields, there's signs everywhere. You know, you don't see PIs, you don't hear about us. So we're always in the background and it's easy to forget about us. Yeah. And I remember I had a PR consultant for several years who was really, really helpful. But the number one thing I think that she found so frustrating working with me, or at least from my perspective, I don't know, she could have had other things she didn't like about working with me. But the number one thing was that she was always saying, can you get your clients to leave recommendations, reviews, you know, referrals, things like that, <laughs> testimonials on your website? And I would say, 
you know, (laughs) so-and-so. No, I can't because these are very sensitive private matters. I mean, how many businesses really want to say, oh yeah, Leo was so great at, you know, investigating an embezzlement for us. Right. Yeah. It's just publicizing that. Then not only that is on pretty much every case I have, I have an NDA. So I can't, these people are not going to come forward and make a Google review about what I did for them. So yes, I I completely understand on that level as well. Unless there's like, I don't know, I've had a couple or like attorneys will leave reviews, you know, sure. Reviews, yeah. Right. Because that, you you don't know who the end client was, but yeah, that was, that's true. Yeah, we were, um, I was talking to somebody just today about how we can have all these credentials and licenses and all of those things. And we can say, this is what we want to get paid. But if we don't actually know how to do business development, networking, marketing, like you said, it's it's all well and good, but we got to be able to. Right. You can be the best of the best, but if you're not out there marketing, it it's not going to matter. And letting people know what you do. Yeah. yeah, letting people know what we do. And then even that 90% of the time, even if you explain it to them, they still don't understand. So right. you, you still have to tell them, hey, this is our specific niche. This is what we do and really hone it in and then just keep putting your name out in front of them. So that's that's really what I found to be the uh, most surprising thing after I got into the industry was yeah. kind of getting into the industry. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. You know, but even those like niche areas, like whenever you've explained it, it's incredible. I remember whenever we started specifically trying to get outside of Oklahoma, so we needed to use more digital marketing efforts. And I remember thinking, I don't have anything to say to anybody who wants to listen to me. But as just like what you said, explaining what you do, it's amazing how much content can come from explaining this little niche or this one service, like what we're here to talk about today, just like this one thing that you do. There's a lot of content and education that can come out of that. Yeah. The amount of training that we have to go through just to stay on that curve with laws and, you know, working with uh, software and everything we have to put continue, when they say continuing education, I mean, it's really something that we have to hone in on, on our skill set. So it's, it's not just once you learn it, it's there. You just, you have to keep at it almost every week, every month, and just keep going with new laws and new strategies, new methods. So it's very interesting. What do you, speaking of training, what has been the most valuable form of training that has helped shape your career? You know, I'm a member of NALI, the National Association of Legal Investigators, and uh, several other associations. Those are all great, and networking is really good. But what has helped me the most during my career so far to date is actually mentorship. I, I, as you know, I I worked with uh, Gary Glanz and there's also another individual, another PI. It's female, but reminded me of a of a female Gary Glanz. Very, oh, how would you put it? That uh, gumshoe, older, very smart, very intelligent. You would never, if you saw her out in a crowd, never know that she was a PI, but sharp as a tack. She was the one that taught me how to write my reports. And, you know, and she was the one that always said that, uh, oh, she goes, Nick, if if you ever have a bad, bad case, which... You will, as you know, Leah, there's there's those cases that no matter what you do, it could just be a bad case. She's like, a good report will fix a bad case. And that's something that you you often see with PIs now. Is they don't know how to write a, a report. It's just part of the analytics or something that they don't want to put the time into the report or they don't know how to properly explain what they're saying or how to decipher it for the client so that not only the client wants to read it and they can read it quickly, because as attorneys don't have all this time in the world to read a really condensed or a comprehensive report to make it to where they can consume all that or digest all that information you're giving them in a real simple manner. But at the same time, that um, the reports that they were able to consume that uh, condensed information down into what is the most beneficial for their time frame. And uh, a lot of PIs just don't know how to do that. And mentorship so by far was has been the best thing for me. And I, I always seek out, no matter how far along I am in my PI career, I always seek out additional mentors. You know, if I'm trying to, if I notice that, hey, this person knows something that I don't know, I will always kind of have that, okay, I need to be more around them because I can improve my skills around them. I think that's the best. I know other PIs would say other things, but mentorship by far and surrounding yourself in a good network of people are the best things in our industry. We often have 
people who reach out and ask us if they can do internships or volunteer or whatever to kind of get experience. And that just from a forensic accounting standpoint, that is really difficult. <laughs> I'm just being real transparent in these episodes, but um, it's really difficult. You know, how do you drop somebody in on a case that it might take three weeks to get complete information and then the learning curve and all of that. And, and I know that that's frustrating as an investigator. So this is how I handled mentorship. And then I'm curious how, how you've gone about it, because maybe you have been around mentors that didn't mind doing those things. But when people reach out to me, it, it is complicated to try to bring somebody into a case and confidentiality and all of that. At the same time, so how I handled mentorship, because I would agree, having mentors to, to help you navigate some of the pitfalls of a case, I mean, that's invaluable. I mean, you can't even put a price on that. So what I would do is whenever I got a case, going back to that marketing, networking, business development, I would go get the case. And then I would ask someone with more experience, would you like to work on this case with me? So then both of us are being compensated for our time. I'm the newbie, but I'm bringing the work in, right? And then I'm gaining experience and also valuing that person's time. Now, there's stuff in those conversations and everything that sure, they don't get paid for. And that I remember to this day, they're like, oh, that was such a good, good advice on that case that I've taken. But I feel like that has worked really well. What about in your experience? Is that how you brought in, built those mentor relationships? Or have you found people who were willing to kind of take you under their wing? You know, and, I, and the thing with, with mentors that, that I built out or that I was able to I went through associations first and in actuality, I think I actually, Gary, I, I had actually met through somehow through you. There was some kind of, uh, I think we had discussed him at one time or you, you had maybe given me an introduction, which would have been a form of networking. And uh, I, I can't quite, it's been so long ago. I'm trying to remember how, how I had that exact introduction to Gary, but most people had, I was able to get those introductions to mentors because of they knew my work ethic and they knew that I was willing to put in something and they could get something back from me. You know, it wasn't a one-sided deal like like what you're saying. You can't just go in and just expect, hey, this person's going to teach me everything and then they're going to leave. It doesn't work like that with, with mentorship. One person, each party, it has to be a partnership in there. And that's what a mentorship is about. You will always, when there's a partnership on it, you'll always walk out of it knowing something more than you did when you went in. And that's, that's how you grow in our industry is having, you will always be the best in your field when you have more knowledge and more wisdom, you know, that you can charge all you want and, but you can still be the stupidest person in our industry, you know? I mean, it may not last very long, but. It may not last very long. That's exactly right. But, you know, as, as long as we're partnering with individuals that are like-minded and our ethics are high, our standards are high, so we're not willing to, to bring it down below a certain bar. You know, and we're partnering with each other to where we're, we're continually learning. I feel like that's the appropriate manner that I've gone in the past about mentorship. Well, very cool. Well, I want to get into our topic for the day, but first let's take a quick break. We love fun projects around here at Workman Forensics, and our newest adventure is taking place in the form of an escape room. Novel Mysteries is our first escape experience based on the novel Blood on the Mother Road, No Place to Hide by Tulsa author Mary Coley, the 2022 Oklahoma Book Award for Fiction recipient. Booking opportunities for this exciting immersive experience are available at novelmysteries.com. Welcome back to my conversation with Nick. So Nick, today we're talking about nursing home abuse and neglect investigations. So first, how do you define this topic? What, what's involved typically in these investigations? Okay, so one first, and this is my opinion as an investigator who's worked on these cases for several years, and um, just to kind of give you some background, I was trained by literally some of the best attorneys in this field in both Oklahoma and Texas. They they sent up all their attorneys, hey, put me hands on. This is how we do these types of cases. There's not courses you can take for nursing home abuse and neglect investigations. You just have to have that hands on in the moment. And um, there was a, uh, a firm out of, I believe it's Houston, was where that, that law firm was. And they sent up their investigator and said, hey, Nick, uh, we, we're going to have our investigator work with you. And he's going to show you how to write reports, how to take statements, do everything, how, what specifically to look for in these cases. And also I worked with uh, their nurse case manager, which is basically an RN, a registered nurse. And 
They're like, okay, so when you look at the medical documents, uh, medical charts, here's what you're looking for, A, B, and C, and so forth. And this is how you, when you're talking to your witnesses, this is how you lay out your questions. So you got you kind of have to understand that when you read or when you hear the word nursing home, abuse and neglect, abuse and neglect is not one word. It's it's two. Abuse shows an intention. Basically, it's an intentional act. And so there could be several things in this, just, but just to give you some examples, there is um, staff or, and it's, to give you an idea of this, it's a medical professional at a nursing home or a staff member that's a, verbally degrading a patient or threatening a patient. So it could be verbal. It could be emotional. Elderly are typically very, um, the at that stage in their life, when at a long-term care facility, assisted living or otherwise, they can be a little bit more malleable in their, their frame of mind. And a lot of people, they have a, unfortunately to say, there are those people that they will use that to their advantage. That's considered abuse. Then there's also uh, where they physically manipulate a patient. That's where they forcibly try to make them do actions that they are not used to or they're not, they're not able to do that. And then also where another physical aspect of that would be injuring a patient where you can just, you hear about this often, they, a medical professional will just, they get frustrated or they get upset. They take their anger out of them out on an uh, elderly uh, patient and either beat them in the face or they um, break their bones, push them down, one of those things. And then also the, what I've also seen is sexually abusing a patient. That is, you wouldn't think that's a topic that comes up with elderly care, but it is very much so. Um, and that's something that we will be discussing here later at, uh, as an example. Those are the for that's what I would say on the abuse side, the neglect can be intentional or unintentional. And so whenever I say neglect, that's often where they think of it this way. Um, neglect is where a nursing home, they didn't do their background checks because they're trying to have a profit margin up there. Um, a lot of these profit of these nursing homes are have shareholders so you know they have to keep their profit margins up here so they've got to bring their costs down so they will hire less skilled nursing staff to pay the minimum wage it's not so much as a willful intent as it is hey we've got to meet a profit margin and so we're going to place profit over people um, other times they smaller nursing homes just don't have the money to replace equipment like lifts and things where then because they're not responsible in that manner, their patients or their residents, they get injured. They, they get hurt, which at that age, a broken bone can eventually lead to death. Uh, it's, it's sad, but you see that as some of the most common themes of and the differentiation between abuse and neglect. So who hires you in this type of investigation and what role do you play? So I am hired by and I strictly work for attorneys. And when I say that, it's because it's not that I don't want to work for individuals. I'm certainly more than happy to, but I will refer them to an attorney for attorney client privilege and then to go through that process to, so we can obtain all the information and we're not just spinning our wheels, wasting client money, because I'm not about that. I'm, I'm about, hey, let's get in there. Let's get this case done. Because once we start on a case, that means that, and, I, and I'm just going to be blunt about this, cases have to be moved as quick as possible so that you can find all the witnesses possible on a, on a witness list before. And we've seen this Time and again, and, and I'm, when I say we, I'm not just referring to, you know, my private investigation firm, but others in other states, other colleagues that I work with that are specialists in the nursing home field who have written books. And we've all seen this. It's not a, not a one-time thing where a nursing home will go out and scare a, one of their employees and, or threaten them not to say something. Even though there's whistleblower laws or the, you know, the whistleblower's law, people still get scared and they still are threatened and they don't want to talk to us. So we, once we get all our information, we come up with a case plan and we move like lightning. We, we get our, we talk to all our witnesses, we get everything down and 
we there's a certain way that we are able to make sure that we get all our information at once. Yeah. Speaking of that, what access do you have to obtain evidence? And, and specifically, I guess, what type types of evidence do you try to obtain? And then what access do you have, you know, to, to obtain that evidence? Yeah, that's a good question. So typically that goes through the attorney and through the discovery process. And we, the bare minimum that I like to have for my investigative standpoint are the one, it's going to be the medical records because you can pull surveys. Uh, there's what's called a nursing home survey and, and it's on, uh, on the state website. The state has keeps surveys of each of the nursing homes and long-term facilities, assisted living facilities where home, uh, nursing home inspectors have gone in and done periodic checks because all these facilities are licensed by the state. So they have to be inspected by basically state investigators. If, if for some reason they go in on their scheduled time, which just so you know, most nursing home facilities know that they're already coming. If they're short staffed, which nursing homes typically are, because that's one of the ways they keep their profit margins high up, you know, and the expenses down, it's, we, we see it time and time again, whenever there was on the timesheets, all of a sudden, you know, week after week after week after week, there's low people, there's low staff, then on the day of the inspection, there's a lot of people there. And then, you know, I always work with an attorney and I always refer my clients to uh, attorneys. We, I work with exceptional attorneys that specialize. You always want to find an attorney that specializes in nursing home abuse, nursing home abuse and neglect cases because it's not one that a general attorney knows how to handle mm-hmm. or ends and outs. Sure. Like with everything, you want to find a specialist. And so the evidence that they obtain, obtain during discovery, we're talking about the medical charting of the resident or the patient. And keep in mind, most of the time that I receive the, the case is maybe a year, year and a half after the incident. And that, I mean, it's just by the time it goes to they filed and you get discovery that in most of the time, the individuals are deceased just because of the severity of the type of case. And um, it, it is sad, uh, but we also look at time charts that we get to see who was on, who was at the facility at that time. And then as well as, and that that's the thing you have to understand about these, these nursing home ca- cases that we receive. Whenever we get it from a facility, and I don't want people to think that nursing homes overall are, are just inherently bad. There's not, there's great people out there people that want to do great things to help the elderly. But there's also, like I said, those nursing homes that you just see over and over and over again, they just put profits over people. So they will, whenever we receive the records, instead of putting names on charts like medical charting, they'll put initials or they'll put initials on timesheets. So you don't know who was where and who was at which time, or they'll use numbers. Or So what you have to do is you have to use the surveys, the state surveys, to coincide everything, and the state surveys are anonymous, so they're redacted, and or they'll say, investigator, I think it's like surveyor one, went into resident's room, and so there's a methodology that, that it, I was taught on how to read these charts and correlate, like we were talking about earlier, all the analytics and connecting the dots, and then you go find your witnesses. We use that as a starting point, so it's medical records, timesheets, surveys, I mean, it is, when you're talking records, they they send me boxes of records to go through. You know, it's when it's like most of the cases that that we've seen together. It's those banker boxes that you just have loads of them, and you're going through and highlighting them every single thing you need, and then you make notes of who you need to go find, who you need to go talk to, and just deciphering that information. So you use the information in like the medical charts or records, timesheets, state surveys to ident- identify then the people that you're going to go interview about the incident. Is that correct? That is correct. And it's not like we've always, like I think you and I had a conversation not too long ago. It's Our, our work is not clear cut. It doesn't just say, hey, you need to go here. It's you have to, there was a two initials on a chart out of, how many people that were employed at that facility. And sometimes you don't know who was employed at that facility because they don't send you those records or those records magically disappeared. And so you have to find another person. You have to find that connection. You have to, it's, 
it's pretty much every case that, that you could become involved in from a missing persons case to a locate to witness statements to, you know, interpreting medical data along with, with a case, a nurse case manager and to have optimal case results for the client. So then with these findings, like after you've interviewed these individuals, what do you do with your information? Do you end up testifying to it? Do you uh, just turn it over to the attorney so that they can work their side of the case? What, what do you do with this evidence? The way I work it, and one of my colleagues, and, and this was, it's different in different states. So in Oklahoma, this works, you know, and it works quite well, is the... I go out and I find the witnesses. We create what is an affidavit. It's a statement of it's a statement of fact. I was here on this date. I saw this happen, and I was employed from this date to this date. It's what you truly have to find in these cases are the medical staff or the staff at a nursing home that actually care about the residents, and that's what this is all about. It's about the residents, or it's about someone's loved one that got hurt. It's not about a lawsuit. It's not about what some people think is revenge or, you know, just being angry, being being frustrated. It's about that the statistic came out a short while ago, and I'm trying to remember when it came out, that one in 14 cases of abuse and neglect in the U.S. get reported in nursing home. So for what you hear for the majority, multiply that by 14, and you'll, you'll have a solid average. Oklahoma is up there right around the 46th I think that's what it was last. I think Texas is the worst still in the in the state, in the United States. Oklahoma is around 46th, 47th, I believe. And uh, depending if uh, Puerto Rico's sometimes in that statistic, you have to understand some states are great at really looking at it from a, hey, these are, these are our, our loved ones. These are our parents. These are our grandparents. Other states, especially Oklahoma, we do not have a agency that really polices nursing homes. It's there, but they all, it's that same statement that you always hear. There's not enough funding. It's they just don't police it. And the, like I said earlier, nursing homes always know when these are coming up, when these surveys are coming up, these inspections. And so it's they're always properly staffed at those times. They always uh, have every hot meal out everything. So there is the elderly are not in any way, shape or form whenever they see it in need. But but on the evidence that we see, it's it's different. So that's what people do have to understand. This is about their loved one. It's not about any type of other figure. So before we wrap up, do you have a case story that you can share with us? So there are two types of cases that I typically see is one is the going to be the like we said, the neglect it, which is going to be where someone is, they don't turn the elderly or the patient or the resident. And so, which becomes, there's a, you know, all the pressure on, let's say a hit. And one specific case, there was an individual where they just, she was overweight by her, by, by standards. So they just didn't turn her. And eventually because of the thinned out skin and which occurs with most elderly people, that the skin just for lack of a better word, you know, uh, in layman's terms, broke. And then it started to, they didn't treat it where they cleaned it off. And so and this gets graphic is where then it starts, the flesh starts to rot and they'll, they'll pack it. But once it is, once it's there, it just kind of gets, you start to smell the, the rotting flesh and eventually they do die from that. And that's, that's the neglect part that you see a lot of times is they won't turn the individuals, they won't pay attention to them. And with neglect, you... That was a that was a difficult that was a difficult case to see. And in that case, did you end up interviewing different people to find out kind of what happened? And then what what can you say what the result of that case was? I believe what that on that particular case, I went around and spoke to the RN. There were two RNs on that on that file, and they they provided a an affidavit and a recorded. So basically, it's a recorded statement with an affidavit written affidavit where they signed off on it stating that, hey, this interview was accurate and these are the actual statements. And then I notarize it, you know, because mm-hmm. to authorize it and everything. And and then I believe there were three or four, I'm trying to remember right off the top of mind, LPNs that worked and then that rotated that some knew of her, some had direct contact with her. You'll always find that, that they're not directly affiliated, but they know of how many, what's the staff to patient ratio and how full is the facility compared to what their occupancy rating is, what the facility was initially designed for. A lot of these facilities, 
they they were only designed to hold 150 people and now they're holding 300 and so which means their bathroom facilities their their food facilities their nursing stations they can't they weren't designed to contain that capacity so it means they're just again bumping that up so that's what you see a lot of and then you really get into the the CNAs and the CMAs and those are the people that have the hands-on care they will keep the the residents clean that's at least that's their job mm-hmm. and the CMAs can also help them with medication. Whether they get that medication or not, that's that's a different story. So you have to follow through on everything. There's a certain type of, or a certain list that you ask of each CMA to make sure that, hey, are those, is that prescription being stolen or are they receiving what they're supposed to? Are they being over-medicated? Because you will see that with a lot of nursing homes. And over-medication does lead to quite a bit in our in our industry, especially in Oklahoma, I believe the last statistic I saw was uh, we were number one for over medicating our elderly in uh, nursing homes and long term care facilities. Well, wonderful! You are really helping people want to move to Oklahoma through this podcast episode. Yes, and I I do apologize. Long care. <laughs> the positive aspect. Oh that my I'm gosh! Doing. So, but uh, and that's uh, and I, I can provide references for that at the very end. Or, or uh, then also, what you also see on the other side of it is going to be the abuse, and this one is a little bit more. If we have a few minutes, I, I don't want to over. There's a. Uh, you do have cases like this where nursing homes don't always know who they've hired. And uh, of course, that's common with any any company. There was a case that I investigated. The individual, I'll put it that way, had raped multiple residents and had also assaulted some of the RNs. And um, and this, was, this one actually turned out good because this person turned out to be, the information was turned over to the authorities, and this was also used in, uh, after that was finished, it was turned into a civil case, you know, you can tell. And, um, but what was difficult was talking to the nurses, the LPNs, and the CNAs about this individual. What they, there's kind of an emotional trauma, as you can imagine, and how they wanted to talk about it, but they didn't really want to talk about it because a lot of people are in fear for their jobs. When you approach people who who really want to make a difference, they, they will talk to you. It's just they need to understand the context of what's going on. And this this particular individual did receive prison time, and the family or families, just kind of leaving it ambiguous, did receive compensation for what sh- could have been prevented. Do you think it could have been prevented by like a background check? Had, had, was this person a repeat offender? In this case, it, yes, it could have been pre- prevented entirely. And uh, it was one of those cases where, as you and I both know, if you just a cursory background check on, you know, on Google or something doesn't do anything. But if you hire a professional to do the background checks, then yes, you can you can normally mitigate a large portion of your liability. Yeah, um, for sure. For in this in this instance, let's put it that way. Yeah. So kind of to wrap up here. Um, you know, since we've had a couple of stories that are definitely sobering I, and and I don't, I always want to discuss the realities, right, of what's yeah. happening in the world. And as an investigator, I mean, we just see things that maybe others don't necessarily think, see or even think about. Having worked these investigations, what are some of the things that you recommend people? And I know you have a white paper on your website that we'll link to in the show notes, but what are just a couple of the things that you recommend when people are trying to make a decision on a nursing home? I would go obviously visit the location. I mean, some people just say, hey, this this one fits my Medicare or my my budget, which mm-hmm. that's, I understand that is, especially nowadays, that is a priority is because long-term care, assisted living, it's expensive. You know, that that's certainly something to consider, but go visit the location. Go talk to the individuals. Go talk to the staff. Whenever you're walking in the halls, see if food is sitting out in the hallways. Is the food cold? Because you know, there's there's a certain you know staff to patient ratio. If the CNAs aren't able to keep up with all of their their individuals that they're assigned to, then your loved one's going to get cold food, or they're not going to get fed because eventually that food's going to go back and thrown away. So, which also means that your loved one, if they need to go to the restroom and they need help getting up, they're going to be sitting in their own urine, their own fecal matter, and they can't make it. Which means they're going to try to get out of their bed, possibly fall, break their hip. And then that could lead to additional issues. And, you know, something like that would be great. 
do an interview, like I said, with the staff. And when you're looking at the staff, make sure you note their names. Ask for the names of the staff. That's your right to know who's taking care of your loved one when you're doing this. Look, and then on my white paper, uh, which will be linked in the notes, which is uh, nursinghomeinvestigator.com, I'll show you links on what to pull up. You can pull up all of Oklahoma's RNs, which is the registered nurse, and the LPNs. And then you can see their, their uh, put in their names. And then I'll show you, hey, do they have a disciplinary action? If so, what's that action for? You know, a lot of, a lot of them have been there previously, have a disciplinary action for uh, stealing drugs, being high on drugs, while their, their UA or the year now failed whenever they were administering medical treatment. These are things that everyone needs to know. And you do have a right to know. And also you can go to what I provide too is the link to look at surveys for medical or nursing home facilities or long-term care facilities. And you can see in there, well, hey, the survey found last time they won't provide, like I said, detailed information like a person's name or the the um, investigator's name. They won't provide any of that. But it will say, hey, what we found here was that the a person, they call them F tags and there are different types of tags in there. And you can read the actual case notes where it says, hey, this person, it was found that this person fell due to negligence or not negligence, but it, they, they called something else in there. But it will tell you that there was what type of issues were involved, whether it was, it was a slip and fall because no one was watching them when they were supposed mm-hmm. to. Right. And whether uh, medication, yes, this was, they were, they didn't receive their medication on time, mm-hmm. which caused additional issues. There are a lot of different things people can take to per be proactive in preventing these types of issues. But if anyone ever has any questions, they can feel free to call me. I mean, this is a passion of mine. It's not just, uh, it's not something I've seen it time and time again, and it's something you carry, but you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking time to talk with me today, Nick. And if any of our listeners want to connect with you, we'll make sure to list all of uh, your contact information if they have any questions, and uh, we'll make sure to mention those in the show notes. I appreciate it. Thank you, Leah. Thank you for listening to the Investigation Game podcast. For more information on any of the topics brought up on this show, visit workmanforensics.com. If you enjoyed our show, please be sure to subscribe and leave a review. You can also connect with us on any social media platform by searching Workman Forensics. If you want to learn more about using data and forensic accounting engagements and fraud investigations, make sure to check out my book, Data Sleuth, available on Amazon or anywhere else you like to buy your books.